Every good sermon should start with Beyonce. And we're definitely thinking a lot about her these days since her song Freedom is the anthem for the Harris presidential campaign and that message resonates. The lyrics are about the most inspirational value countries can aspire to uphold for citizens to experience freedom. And it's something that Jews all over the world have lauded for thousands of years, especially at Passover. We force ourselves to imagine a kind of slavery, a kind of lack of freedom, so that we can experience the joy of being set free, mainly from the drabness of matzah. But more seriously, thanks for the belated. <laughs> but more seriously, so that we can appreciate and give thanks for the freedoms that we do have. And for a people who have historically been subjugated, victims of criminalization, bigotry, and anti Semitism in the ancient, medieval, and modern worlds. Freedom is, of course, the dream. Ours is a loving, valiant struggle for freedom. Every Passover, even as free as we have felt, we have acknowledged that others in the world are not yet free, and we have pledged to continue the work for freedom wherever it is threatened. At the end of the Seder, we say, now we are slaves, next year we shall be free. But what is freedom? In the Passover story, we recount becoming free from Egypt, and Egypt can be seen as a metaphor for any corrupt government entity. And of course, the word Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim, and it means a narrow place, literally. In our weekly healing circle at Keeping It Sacred, we ask for healing for anyone who is in any kind of narrow place anywhere. Cheryl Aronson began that tradition. And this is fitting because we know that the experience of lacking freedom is a feeling of being cramped, of being stifled and suffocated. In the Mishnah Shemot Rabbah 41, Rabbi Nehemiah says, freedom means freedom from the angel of death. The rabbis say freedom from suffering. We might add true freedom means freedom from fear, freedom from degradation, freedom from all threats to our humanity. But freedom doesn't only have to evoke a sense of freedom from some evil. At best, affirming freedom evokes a sense of freedom to be able to do something. We think of the freedom of bodily autonomy, freedom to find meaningful work, and the freedom to be able to build a family as we choose or move across borders around the world. So we think of freedom twofold, freedom from suffering and narrowness and freedom to enjoy expansiveness. But this year we have struggled finding freedom. We have fe felt a new sense of suffocation. We have choked back and stifled our words we have dulled our expression of Judaism. We have failed to ask hard questions. We have muted our voices, fearful of reactions. And when we have mustered the courage to speak up and speak out, we've had to do so with great caution, concern for who is going to react in what way. Our dearest friends have signaled their stance one way or another and many of us no longer feel the freedom or ease to speak as we once did, nor to have the hard conversations as we once did, nor uh, where can we speak freely anymore? Outside the Jewish community, inside the Jewish community, at work, with our friends, with members of our own family, our freedoms seem to be eroding and it is interpersonal. It's among our neighbors who may fly flags while we wonder what they mean and what they might stand for. If they display a Palestinian flag, do they want death to Jews or are they signaling their desire for freedom for the Palestinian people? If they display an Israeli flag, are they in support of 
any means necessary, including killing tens of thousands of innocents? Or do they just want a safe place for half the world's Jewish population to live freely and safely as Jews? Without the free exchange of respectful conversation, we can never know what people mean. We struggle to know who to believe and what people are actually saying. And suddenly we realize those freedoms that we were accustomed to, that perhaps we had taken for granted, are being stifled. And there are those in the Middle East, we mourn their lack of freedom on all levels. People have been taken for a ride by political leaders seeking to promote their own ends. Before October 7th, already 500,000 Israelis took to the streets in just one Tel Aviv protest against government corruption and hard-headedness. Since October 7th, at least 1,240 protests have been recorded across the country. And just last month, as I mentioned last night, 750,000 Israelis again rallied. That's 10% of the Jewish Israeli population in one rally. These are people standing up for freedom from a government who does not act for them or represent their ideals. A government who employs a military solution to everything, including dissidents. A government that advances a right-wing agenda that erodes the principles of equity and humanity. It's no surprise that hundreds of thousands of Israelis and countless others throughout the world want to get the hostages out via a diplomatic solution. They want to stop the killing. What a basic request, stop the killing. This all the while the people, the people of Israel endure a barrage of missile fire and threat of Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis. And the people who happen to live on another side of a political border endure a barrage of searing aero acoustics from fighter jets dropping bombs, killing generations, generations and generations of family in one instant, never knowing if they will be next, never knowing where is safe. People who have been uprooted from their meager existence forced to walk towards safety only to find it isn't safe there either. People who are denied food and shelter forget about health care and schooling. Basic needs denied. And there's nowhere to go. Nowhere to experience safety, let alone freedom. If you were there, what would you do? Where would you go? I ask myself that a lot. And the hostages, hidden deep underground, some suffocated by the fumes from bombs dropped by those charged with the mission to save them, some killed by friendly fire, all abducted, terrified, tortured, assaulted, hidden deep in locked confines by terrorists, captive underground, where they cannot navigate their way to freedom, even if they were to somehow miraculously escape. My God, such an erosion of freedoms this year. We are locked up, knotted in a web of bad actors and the worst of what humanity is capable of. And it feels unbearable. So we're here left wondering, how can we get back our humanity? Today is a day amidst a month dedicated to teshuva, often translated as repentance, but teshuva also means to turn back to our best selves. So we ask, how do we turn back? How do we reorient our world and point us in the direction of freedom for all, toward human dignity and an end to suffering? And how can we come to truly understand that freedom for one is freedom for all of us? Our freedoms are intertwined. There are a few communities that I know asking these questions, refusing to be divided. People whose actions are commendable. First, there is all of you, the people of keeping it sacred. You've been able to find sacred space in which to ask one another the hard questions, a space in which we have found to always, always, 
always center human dignity. We hold space for a spectrum of opinions as long as it isn't just flat out rhetoric. <laughs> as long as it isn't parroting some political action committee or some TikTok soundbite. We invite people to share their human experiences and perspectives. And yes, we have members with long histories of living on kibbutzes, and we have members with long histories of standing up against state-sponsored violence, and we have people here in our community eager to learn. But every one of those we gather with are people who are willing to be vulnerable and who refuse to see only the most vulnerable of one side against the most vicious of the other. Every one of us is committed to standing against cruelty everywhere and standing with the most vulnerable everywhere. And we do that authentically and rooted in Jewish values that promote human life. Now I'm not talking about tiptoeing around one another's thoughts or hard questions. I'm not talking about living in an enforced code of being politically correct. I'm not talking about stifling real conversation. I'm talking about creating a culture of affirming freedom for oneself and one another. I'm talking about creating a culture and community dedicated to being kind, being open-hearted and tender-hearted, all in the name of freedom of hearing not only what someone says, but why they are saying it, and being brave enough to share what we think and why we think it, and being willing to ask the hard questions from one another, and to quiet our defensive instincts in order to seek answers to advocate huma humanity together, to share our experiences and to find ways of connecting across difference, to seek ways through challenges together, and we need everyone's questions and everyone's best thinking to find the solution. Thank God we're a global community. We have a lot of good ideas and a lot of different uh, case studies. We need more communities committed to this way of interacting. Certainly, I wish our world leaders would start with this. But in the meantime, there are communities that do this. Keeping It Sacred has partnered with several organizations that we affirm are committed to doing this hard work along with us. Even though the news media is littered with polarized exaggerations of the debates and extractions of the debates, here are there are communities living in the nuance and affirming the humanity as we are at Keeping It Sacred. And we have partnered with many of them this year, happily. We've partnered with interfaith groups like the Interfaith Solidarity Network and the Interfaith Council of Greater Rancho Santa Margarita who are holding space for dialogue and understanding and the Jewish community called Nefesh and the Muslim community called Muslims for Progressive Values who are encouraging their members to hold space for humanity regardless of which border it falls on. We've partnered with progressive faith-based communities like All Saints Church of Pasadena and the First Unitarian Church of Los Angeles and the Immaculate Heart Community who cherish human dignity and promote it. We've partnered with the Jewish spiritual community in the Galilee called Nigun Halev, Song of the Heart, and the interfaith community called Spirit of the Galilee, who not hours after the October 7th attacks collectively responded to the grief of Jews, Muslims, Druze, and Thai workers by helping families mourn their victims and by working together to provide food and shelter to all displaced by the war. And thanks to the generous support of our community members, we were able this year to partner with the Parent Circle, which is a community of people whose loved ones were killed in the conflict. Imagine that. Their most precious ones were murdered, and still they are seeking a way through to peace. They're committed to freeing themselves from debasing thoughts of revenge and freeing themselves from turning into murderous monsters. They instead dedicate themselves to the goal that not one more parent or spouse or sibling or child should mourn due to the conflict. There are plenty of communities who affirm this open culture of affirmation and understanding. 
But as you know, not every community is like this. And so I too don't feel free in every community. Maybe you don't feel free to raise the questions in many of the circles that you're part of too. Maybe you don't feel free to raise these questions among your family members. I haven't felt totally free at meetings of fellow rabbis. Among us, we're reform, reconstructionist, and conservative rabbis, congregational, communal, and chaplain rabbis. One day, our group got together to discuss a big event planned for Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israeli Independence Day this year. And what happened? My colleagues were imagining a candle lighting to remember the fighters of each of the wars for Israel, Israel statehood. 1948, 1967, 1973. And I, I only mustered the courage to ask that please, the final candle would be dedicated to not having to mourn more deaths or fight more wars. They actually appreciated that comment. And sure, this was a contribution to the conversation that affirmed peace and humanity. And Melissa said it was a beautiful answer. But I still felt like, and I still feel like, maybe I could have done more. Like questioned why we would participate in further valorizing warfare without nuance. Without at least questioning how these symbols might resonate for those in attendance, and what messages might be taken from doing so. Perhaps there was another thing that I could have said or question that I could have asked that would be taken seriously or respected or not taken as an attack, but rather advanced our thinking about the event being planned more deeply, more intentionally, more thoughtfully. But these conversations take relationship based on trust. Or maybe they don't. The sad part is by my not saying anything and not raising questions and working through the issue, instead I denied my colleagues a voice as well and an opportunity to find a way forward together. For this, I lift up an al hate. My colleague in Israel, Rabbi Liora Ezrahi Vered, has said of her philosophy, we don't know what the right thing to do is, but we will try to find answers together. We need to give it a chance. We need to give each other a chance to hear and be heard to work together toward a solution. That is the kind of freedom we need to work for in the future, to not assume that others will demonize us, to free ourselves from the fear of risk, to free ourselves from fear or hatred or being called whatever names people might call us or ostracizing us in whatever ways people might ostracize us. Freedom from falling into the political agendas of organizations that would rather have us pa paralyzed in fear. Freedom from institutions that benefit the war machine. So here we are on the holiest day of the year, contemplating freedom. How can we make the world more free for all people? So this sermon is part question, part expression of grief, part confession, but also part pep talk, part encouragement, and a big part is a prayer that we might be able to this year to free our mind and to free our heart from the burden of fear and pain. And as we find ways to free ourselves, so may, might we bring freedom everywhere. Amen. <laughs>